Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight as we look into God's Word. God's Word is so awesome, and the more I learn, the more I understand it, the more I realize I don't know. So let's look a little bit deeper tonight and hopefully share something that will trigger your heart and the Holy Spirit can use, and you can hide it in your heart that we might not sin against God. So let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for the opportunity of coming together tonight via internet and on uh, live stream. And God, we just ask you to help us to minister the word. Let your word come alive to us. God, I know that there are many, 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 many needs represented by the listening audience. And we ask you to minister to them. Show yourself mighty. Show yourself strong. God, touch those sick bodies. Strengthen those weak bodies. Encourage those de depressed. Minister as only you can do. And God, we will thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, last week we shared about God's ability to provide for us and his unlimited power. That was all in chapter 40, and we'll look back a little bit uh, about that today. But today we go to chapter 41, and this is an awesome chapter, and uh, I don't want to get bogged down. If so, we won't be able to cover it all today. But I love the first verse of this chapter as it begins talking about God's providential God's providential control. Now, I know there's a lot of debate on what God's providence. Basically, it just means God knows what's going on. God is able to take care of us. But let's look at that first verse in chapter 41. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. And let us meet together at the place of judgment. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. We need to remind ourselves that nothing catches God by surprise. He is well aware of what you're going through, what I'm going through, what our country's going through. He knows that, what our world is going through. He's well aware of what each one of us is going through today. And the Creator, in His awesome power, not only knows about it, but He has the ability to handle it. Now, as I was reading that, it says, let us meet together at the place of judgment. I was really um, intrigued by that translation in the New Living Translation. That last line, it says, the court is ready for your case. The court is ready for your case. I never thought about Isaiah uh, presenting the truth in this uh, manner. But I was reminded after I looked at that of what it said in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Let me read that one. Come, now let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they're red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And I, I was beginning to think, well, God says, okay, let's reason together. And so for the next number of chapters, as we unpack that, we see God telling us about who he is, how powerful he was, and they seem to be presenting a truth that God is who he says he is. He shares numerous prophecies of the coming Messiah. Now, I have often thought about the Gospel of John being a court scene. With every chapter in the Gospel of John being evidence to make the jury, that's the readers, the jury, those that read it, come to the conclusion that Jesus is who he says he is. Now, let's look over there just in comparison. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, speaking of John, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. See, the only thing that they tried Jesus for is and they could find him guilty of is he claimed to be the Son of God. And so John, after walking with him for three years, after hearing him minister, and after writing this uh, later on, he said, 
Jesus did many signs and wonders. It says, but these are written so that you may believe. In other words, that everything that he had told us about in the Gospel of John, he had presented the evidence that Jesus was who he said he was. Now look at the last couple of verses in John. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things that we know that the testimony is true. In other words, I'm speaking as a witness. John was saying, I was an eyewitness to all these things that I wrote. Now, there are also many other things Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Think about that John as a presenting the evidence. He said, Jesus is who he says he is. He is the son of God. He said, I'm eyewitnesses this much. Now, I know there's numerous, numerous, numerous other things that he did that I didn't see, but I vouch that they're all true. So even in the first verse of John, in the beginning was the word evidence, evidence. And so he concludes his book by presenting the jury, that is everyone who reads the Bible. Here it is. What is your verdict? In other words, are you going to believe that God is who he says he is? Are you going to believe what the Bible says? Are you going to listen to the Satan? Are you going to listen to the negativity? Or are we going to believe what the Word of God says? Now, I've already mentioned I never thought about Isaiah written in that way. But it does appear from the verse today that Isaiah was writing together. And of course, Isaiah gives us more prophecies of the Old, cha- old te- excuse me, of, in the New Testament of gives us more prophecies of what happened in the New Testament than any of the other prophets. Talks a lot about the Messiah. And so what did it cover in chapter 40? God's love, God's concern, the frailty or the brevity of life, God's unlimited power, the creator's strength, the futility of idols. In other words, you can depend on idols or you can listen and believe in a living God. And then we come to that verse that we read. It says, the court is ready for your case. The course is ready for your case. So let's read chapter 41. I'm going to read it quickly with um, limited commentary, just looking at it because we want to think about this tonight. And it says, Be silent before you, me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him righteous? The one from the east. We find out that that's referring to a guy by the name of Cyrus, calling him in righteousness to his service. His hands subdue, he hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to wind blown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before, who has done this and carried it through. Calling forth the generations from the beginning, I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. I'm the one. I'm your God. And then he talks about Israel being the special chosen one. The islands have seen him in fear. The ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. Each helps the other and says to his brother, be strong. The craftsman encourages the goldsmith, and who who smooths with a hammer spurs on him who strikes the anvil. He says of the welding, it is good. He nails down the idol so it will not topple. Now, what was that all boiled down? What did that mean? It means that an idol is no stronger or no better than the person that creates it. Think about it, and it talks about the different things. The goldsmith encourage, is encouraged, well, and he smooths with a hammer, and he spurs on that one that strikes with an anvil, and he sells the one doing the welding. It is good. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, who I am chosen, your descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth 
from its farthest corners, I called you and I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will read that promise again because Isaiah was writing prophetically. He really was writing for his present day. He was writing for a generation or so down the road. He was writing to the time the Messiah would be, going, would be born. And he was writing to us. And it's a promise that he has for his children. He says, I have chosen you. And I've not rejected you. So do not fear. For I am with you. That should bring a lot of comfort to each one of us tonight. We realize that regardless of what's going on, it did not catch God by surprise that the sovereign God is able to take care of us and he will uphold us with his righteous right hand. Then it goes on to say, we have nothing to fear. Listen, all who rage against you will surely be shamed in disgrace. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Let me say that again. God is speaking to his church today. Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob. It's kind of interesting to use that worm. In other words, he knows that Jacob had, had resisted him. Jacob had went back on him. But God said, listen, do not be afraid, O little Israel, for I myself will help you declares the Lord your Redeemer the Holy One of Israel see I will make you into a threshing sledge new and sharp with many teeth you will thresh the mountains and crush them and reduce the hills to chaff and you will winnow them and the wind will pick them up and a gale will blow them away but you will rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but that is a beautiful analogy that he talks about. He'll make you a threshing sledge. Okay, what that is, is when they harvested the grain, they would drag something over to break up the cr uh, husk, to break up the husk to release the seed. Because you don't eat this husk, you eat the seed. And so the tr threshing sledge uh, broke it up. And then notice what it says. Uh, and you will reduce the hills to chaff. In other words, the wind will come and pick them up. Pick what up? Pick up all the chaff. Blow away all the trash. Blow away all the garbage. But you will rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. Who do you think the Holy One of Israel would be? Yes, prophetically speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to tell us that our needs will be provided for them. The poor and needy search for water, but there's none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but the Lord will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the deserts into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. So even in the desert, God will provide. And he said, I will set pines in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together so that the people may see and know and may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel cannot fail. The Holy One of Israel has created it. God says, I will provide for you. I will take care of you. And we need to understand something. Idols can't do that. It goes on to say in verse 21, present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's cream. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. We know that an idol can't predict the future. The idol does not know what's going to happen to you. An idol cannot protect you. It says, tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. An idol can't think, can't reason, can't give you thought, or declare to us the things to come. 
Tell us what the future holds so we may know that you're God. In other words, ask the idol. You can ask him anything you want to. And if he begins to speak to you and tell you things that have never happened, then you might could trust an idol. But until an idol can de- become greater than the creator, we don't need to listen to idols. And God is a creator. Do something whether good or bad, so that you will be dismayed and filled with fear, but you're less than nothing, and your idols are utterly worthless. He who chooses you is detestable. Then it goes on to talk about false prophets. It says, I've stirred up one from the north, and he comes. I mentioned Cyrus earlier. I was mistaken. This is when Cyrus was speaking of. He talks about Cyrus, one from the rising sun who calls on my name. Now, I want to go over there because it doesn't really um, name uh, Cyrus at that time. But let's go over to chapter 45, chapter 45 of Isaiah, and we'll find that he is named. Isaiah chapter 45, it tells us, that Isaiah is named, uh, excuse me, Cyrus is named. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, whose right hand I have grasped. Now, again, over in chapter one, he re- 41, he referred to Cyrus. Here he names him. And I know somebody said, well, big deal. Cyrus was well known. He, everybody knew about Cyrus. But Isaiah wrote this, 150 years before Cyrus came on the scene. 150 years before he came on the scene. We know that if you go all the way back to Ezra, and I say all the way back to Ezra, Ezra was actually written quite a bit after the time of Isaiah. But Ezra chapter um, 1 verse 1 and the first year of Cyrus king of Persia that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing this was when they he authorized the rebuilding of the temple roughly 150 years later but God knew it then he revealed it to Isaiah then and Isaiah said uh, and because uh, he wrote this um, about 30, uh, 339 or 338 or excuse me it happened about 339 338 but Isaiah was written around 696 so 150 years once again proof that nothing catches God by surprise. Think about it. He looked forward into the future and he named Cyrus, who was not even born. And he said, he is the one. He is the one. He is the one. What an awesome God we serve. Let me just read, read on there. He treads on rulers as if they were mortar, as if they were potter, potter treading the clay who told us this from the beginning so we could know or beforehand or we could say he was right. No one told us of this. No one foretold it. No one heard the, any words from you. I was the first to tell Zion, look, here they are. I gave to Jerusalem a messenger of good tidings. I look, but there's no one. No one among them to give counsel. No one to give answers when I ask them. See, they're all false. Their deeds amount to nothing. Their images are but wind and confusion. So let's go back and just reiterate that one verse that we uh, read. It says, Be silent before me, ye islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment or what he's saying the court is ready for your case Isaiah said here's the evidence here's the evidence that God is who he says he is I know and I don't understand how anybody could be an atheist I don't have enough faith to be an atheist I don't have a faith enough faith to think this world just happened 
I don't have enough faith to believe that it just evolved. Years ago, I was playing softball and I had a real nice watch on. I just stopped by the field and had my jeans on. So I, I took my watch off so I wouldn't hurt it and get, wouldn't break it. Stuck it in my jeans, slid into second base and broke that watch into dozens, maybe hundreds of pieces. You know, I threw that watch away. If you believed in evolution, I could have put it in a bag and if somebody lived long enough, maybe it put itself back together. You say, that's totally ridiculous. Well, to believe that this world put itself together, to believe that the Bible has never been proven wrong, to know that prophecies thousands of years in advance, God predicted, and he always saying, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what I am means. I am the one that always has been, always will be, and I am. So think about it. He's presenting that evidence. And if you have to be wondering, well, I don't know about this Christianity. I don't know about this Christianity. Well, just think about what Isaiah said in the beginning chapter. Come, let us reason together. In other words, let's look at it and come to a conclusion. And I trust that you come to the conclusion, you say, God has to be God because there's no other way to explain it. I believe the evidence that's been presented that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I trust that you'll believe it as well. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for the opportunity of sharing your word. And God, I certainly do not want to appear arrogant, to appear that I've done anything. The only thing I've done is read your word. Only thing I've done is looked at all the evidence and I've listened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and I've made a decision to believe that God is who he says he is. And so whatever people are going through today, would you just assure them that you know what they're going through and that you're there to hear their cry, you're there to lift them up, you're there to protect them. So Father, we ask that today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that you would continue to show yourself mighty for our families, for our homes, for our churches, for our nation, for our world. And God, we give the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in tonight. Trust you have a great week. We'll see you next week.